Happy Monday. How's it going? It's going well. Good to see you, Joe. Yeah, likewise. How was the uh, weekend? Did you do any jujitsu this weekend? <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, Ken G uh, <laughs> wrote me into uh, going and training with him for a bit. I haven't trained in six so long, though, that it was, it was, it was more like a grappling dummy for him. So it was okay. fun. Yeah. How was your weekend? <laughs> it was good. It was good. Nice. Yeah. Got to do a few cultural events and things and catch up with a few friends, basically. Sounds so, fun. Yeah. Just kind of recovering from the week, essentially. Cool. Yeah. Jeremy, how was your weekend? It was good. We were actually in New Orleans last week uh, for the company what? on-site. We do that once a quarter. Uh, so this weekend was kind of catching up from being being out of town all week. Well, that's cool. That's an interesting place to do uh, an off-site. Uh, it's, it's really cool. Yeah, it's fun. We pick a different city. We've been kind of moving west to east. Uh, so we're going to be going on to the east coast uh, in the next quarter, and then we're going to go to Europe the quarter after oh, that. So oh. it's been fun. Yeah, cities where we don't have any people. The company is fully remote, so... Um, we kind of maybe we might have one person in the city, but we're, we're intentionally not choosing the the kind of locus of where our people are. Mm, that's really cool. Interesting. Yeah, Do you know nice. where you're going in Europe yet, or still figuring it out? We're gonna go to Portugal. Ah, very yeah. nice. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we just we just um, hired the first few European folks on the team, so it's fun for us to go to go to Europe instead of forcing them to come the other way. Right. There's a lot of talent in Europe, honestly, and the job market is very different from the United States. I mean, it seems like you can hire a really proficient team over there for at least for now for less money than you can in the States. Yeah, that may be true. Yeah, yeah we're not really focused on kind of cost savings in it. Yeah. Um, I, but I think the other thing that's interesting is so many people are just you know, going to Europe to work. You know, there are work visas yeah. that make it really easy for, for people to do it. So increasingly, it's like hard... We have some some folks on the team where we're just not even sh exactly sure where they are. You know, from tax purposes, it becomes a little bit complicated. Like they just float constantly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's really cool. Well, um, for people who don't know who you are, do you want to give a quick intro? Yeah, sure. So I'm Jeremy uh, and uh, Jeremy Stanley. I, I am the CTO and co-founder of a company called Anomalo, uh, which does data quality monitoring. Uh, and before that, I was at Instacart. I ran data science and machine learning there. Uh, really fun, fun stint in uh, a company that was going through a ton of changes when I when I started Instacart was losing you know, $15 on every delivery they did. Uh, and you know, when I when I left, we'd achieve unit economic profitability and we're kind of rapidly growing uh, and lots of really fun machine learning and data problems there. And I've been in the in the data ML space, you know, for 20 years now in financial services and advertising technology and a bunch of different bunch of different domains. Well, it sounds like you discovered pretty early that uh, when you're doing data science and machine learning, data quality is like one of your biggest project killers. Yeah, I mean, you just shoot yourself in the foot enough times to build up a really healthy paranoia as a data scientist or machine learning engineer about any and all data that you consume. And then you start putting models into production and they're sitting there running and, and you, know, you kind of lose sleep at night wondering like, what's when's the next time the data is going to come in some malformed way, how should I be retraining the models to correctly adjust for data quality issues? So it definitely became, you know, a personal uh, you know, issue for me. And then as I managed teams, I saw it kind of grow into something that could really cripple an organization, cause you to spend a ton of time, you know, chasing chasing false business leads, right? The, somebody somebody thinks that all of a sudden there's this massive opportunity, but really it's a data quality issue. And so you burn a bunch of credibility and a bunch of time. Uh, in that or or things just kind of going uncaught and accumulating and you end up in this position where like anytime anybody does anything in the data, they have to put on their archaeology hat and go dig through, you know, all of the issues in the data and try to fix and resolve them. Yeah, that's a very good analogy. It very it much is like archaeology or honestly, like I have a PhD in math and it's sort of similar to like trying to solve some, you know, prove some really hard theorem sometimes to find some obscure data quality issue that's like way upstream in a data pipeline somewhere. Yeah. The first thing I do anytime I've joined a new organization is is sit with the data and just visualize it in like, you know, a hundred hundred different ways and try to grok all of the information to, to, to kind of discover all of these hidden issues as best I could. Yeah. Is there like a, a certain um, uh, checklist that you have uh, w when you go about that assessment? Yeah. When I go about uh, like interrogating data and visualizing it and trying to understand what's happening is, is in that context. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you're not not. I mean, there there definitely is, right? You want to you certainly want to do things like visualize missingness, right? That's one of the most most important things. You know, visualizing correlations and distributions. <laughs> 
Um, but honestly, like the most meaningful visualizations come about from thinking about the business model and the physics of the business and asking yourself, how could I best understand how the data either represents or contradicts you know, assumptions about the business and the flow of entities moving through the business um, and just trying to look at it from many different angles. I, I like that term physics of the business. I mean, especially if you're working for a company like Instacart, there's a lot of very concrete physical stuff happening behind the scenes and your data has the capacity to really screw things up. If you, if you handle data or modeling incorrectly, you can actually screw up people's roots. You can screw up people's food deliveries, like all kinds of things. Yeah, it was really, it was, it was, I was like a kid in a candy shop when I started because it was one of the first times I was in an environment where the, the algorithms and the data were directly interfacing with the real world in real time. Um, and at one point I wrote this blog post called uh, Space, Time and Groceries. And okay, you know, I'm going to have to track that down. <laughs> yeah, it's a fun one. You know, and it was actually a bunch of visualizations. Uh, you know, we have uh, had a tremendous amount of uh, GPS information about the location of items in stores, of different routes taken, you know, traffic patterns, and all the kind of routing optimization problems that we were solving. And so, yeah, wrapping my head around the, the physics of that system um, and, you know, the things that the, the kind of chaos of that system was a big part of making even just strategic choices about where to invest. Well, looking at things like how much how much fuel you're saving or wasting and how much time you're saving or wasting for people who are actually delivering stuff physically, it's got to be a pretty fascinating problem. Yeah. yeah. I mean, no, in, in, that in that process, so how, much, how much time do you give yourself to sort of get up to speed on um, the domain itself? Because I, I would imagine that, um, you know, delivering, uh, well, the delivery service is probably a, a bit different than the financial services business and, and so forth. I mean, how much how much leeway do you give yourself in the, uh, I guess, the ignorance gap while you try and get up to speed? Oh, I mean, I was there for three years and I was definitely still ignorant of big parts of, of the business after three years, in part because it was doing so many different things as like a right. marketplace. And so, you know, a lot of it was, was you know, hiring great people um, and giving them a high degree of ownership and trusting them and just advising them as best I could. Um, but, you know, for, for me personally, I think that, you know, one thing I've, adv I've talked to folks, you know, starting their career or, or maybe even like five or 10 years into their career is it, it can be pretty easy to get trapped into a single vertical or a single application. You know, I am a fraud machine learning engineer and that's the thing I do. Um, or I'm a, you know, advertising technology audience targeting, you know, data scientist, or I only work on problems that involve, you know, causal inference. Um, and I think there's a lot of benefit to that, but there's also a lot of benefit to like switching a bunch and trying to tackle new things and thinking about things from first principles, because nobody at the beginning of Instacart was a, you know, logistics grocery delivery in under two hours, you know, specialist, we were all figuring it out. And so you really needed people who could think about things from first principles and we were all coming up to speed. So I don't know if I answered your question. I feel like I just kind of. Yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, this is such an interesting thing to raise is this this idea of like switching tracks during your career, which honestly, I think you can be really successful by doing that several times as you identify opportunities. And it's not like you're completely changing careers. You're just kind of taking the skills you have and identifying, oh, in, in our case, like we both separately were data scientists and realized that a lot of our value actually was in doing better data engineering and frankly, better data quality. And so that's kind of how we ended up where we're at now. Yeah, no, I think moving up and down the uh, the kind of functional organization is super helpful because it br you bring each time you make one of those moves, you bring perspectives from the rest of that value chain that helps you you know so be so much more powerful. So if you if you're if you've been a great data scientist, you know stepping into the shoes of an engineer and working as an engineer for three or four years is incredibly powerful. And if you've done both of those, thinking about things from the product perspective and being a PM is, is, is amazing. And then if you came back to being a data scientist again, you would approach it from a completely different angle and be far more effective. Um, and so I think there's lots of those movements that are really helpful. I think thinking of, about things across different industry verticals is really helpful. The, the, the number of, there's a lot of like, um, uh, you know, kind of, I don't know what you call it, like tribal wisdom in different verticals. Um, and some of it's really useful and ought to be applied in lots of other places. And some of it's complete bunk. And you kind of recognize that if you're coming at it from a different angle, instead of being entrenched in that vertical for a long time, 
And so those switches can be really useful too. Oh, for sure. Like I had a background in a supply chain and lean way back in the day. And I, I can't tell you how much that has had benefits in just every, pretty much every aspect of life, just seeing processes and systems and, yeah. you know, seeing whether, um, you know, they have their benefit and where they, uh, you know, could improve. And that's, it's interesting. I mean, if you're, if, you know, it's, it's a matter of, I think, opening your mind, you know, and, and uh, being open to the idea that you can apply, um, you know, cross-disciplinary um, things, but the, the benefit's huge if you can do it. So that's absolutely Yeah, cool. no, absolutely. Yeah, nothing like <laughs> having a, a, a fresh perspective on problems. Oh, yeah, for sure. Sonny's got a question here related. Um, yes, yeah, so finding these uh, hard, um, real value props is difficult. Uh, any recommendations on best practices? Yeah, you, the, the challenge of you're, you're in a new domain or in a new industry and you're trying to figure out like, what's the problem that I can tackle that's going like, to meaningfully move the needle, right? What's going to really materially affect the business? I think very, very hard to do. Um, you know, I think in my own personal experience, I, if I were to be completely honest, probably only a fifth of the you know, big data machine learning initiatives had positive ROI. Right, and probably you know ten percent of them, um, you know, accounted for ninety percent of the value created. And so I think a part of it is that you you have to iterate and test, um, and like the value of designing the right tests for whatever it is you're doing, and being brutally honest about whether or not you're making progress, and starting simple and iterating from there, you know, allows you to cut bait on, you know, that eighty percent of initiatives that aren't going to work earlier. I think that's probably the biggest thing I see happen is it's not that people don't have enough good ideas. It's that they pick the first one that's decent and they spend two years on it um, mm -hmm. without ever being brutally honest about whether or not it's working and whether or not the rate of change of improvements they're making is going to converge towards something that's going to have a meaningful impact on the business. Um, I think you can short circuit it by thinking about the physics of the business, right? And, and trying to reason hard about what's really possible in the context of that of the physical system and, and operational system that you're in. Uh, but you also just have to be, be really honest with yourself. So it's sort of the convergence of like uh, the abstraction of data and machine learning and data science with just real world, like looking at systems and trying to use common sense to understand what's happening, bringing those together. Yeah, that. no, that's right. But, but how do you, how do you get buy-in for this? I, I, Cause you, you say that, you know, this, a, a small percentage of these, um, these projects end up being successes. Uh, how how do you get the buy-in to continue doing these experiments uh, in light of um, uh, failures? Yeah, it, it can be tough, and especially when you're starting out, right? If you're if you're building a data science or ML function at an organization that's not 100% philosophically bought in, and you're trying to convince the CFO, you know, to fund this thing. What you end up often having to do is pick things, pick the most obvious things. And oftentimes there will be, you know, in a new organization, there will be some obvious things. They may only generate a 20% return on investment, but that's still pretty good. And you can execute on that and build trust. And then you can take, you know, bigger risks and, you know, start to build a portfolio of things and, and be okay with a bunch of them not having a material effect. That makes sense. Interesting. So, um, switching out to data quality, um, you know, let's talk about data quality, the, the hard parts. And so I, I suppose let's, let's level set though. What, what, um, yeah. what's the definition of data quality? Yeah. So the, when I think about data quality, it's uh, ultimately about whether or not end users can trust the contents of the data that they're using. And it could be someone using that data to make a decision or it could be somebody building a machine learning model on that data, making inferences with that data. Um, and so at the root, there's, uh, you know, basically does the data itself, is it an accurate reflection of the real world, of whatever was intended to be captured and logged in the real world? And, you know, that can, can, can range from the data is, you know, missing, uh, missing in a wide variety of ways. It could be that the data has suddenly changed its distribution or shape. It could be that you're, you know, missing a chunk of records in the data. It could be that you have duplicate records in the data. So there's a, a really wide variety of, of ways that data can, can go awry and ultimately leave you in a position with you know, bad data quality. When you see a sudden change in distribution, what's the strategy to recognize if you have a systems problem of some sort, like maybe a change in the app that's breaking data upstream versus a, a real world change of some sort, like 
maybe a big event happened and suddenly people aren't ordering a lot for a day or they're ordering, there's a huge spike in orders. How, how do you quickly differentiate between those two possibilities? Yeah, it's really important. I mean, we saw this happen at Instacart all the time. So my, one of my favorite examples was the Pope visited the U.S. and went on a tour of U.S. cities. And you know, each city that the Pope visited, it got completely snarled in traffic and you know, caused all sorts of downstream problems in all of our systems and disruptions in all of the data. Um, and so I you know, referred to it as the, you know, the Pope visiting problem. Uh, how, do you, how do you separate that out? And in reality, in the context of the data, if you think about a data arriving in a complex data set arriving in a stream and suddenly having a big distribution change, um, just in interrogating the data itself, I don't think an algorithm is going to be effective at telling you, is the change inherently because of a data quality issue or is it something that was intentional? Because many intentional changes will manifest in the exact same way as a data quality issue. Right? So a data quality issue could be, you know, it could be happening in the transformations of data in, in the platform in a SQL statement, and somebody changes a case when statement such that you know, one of the cases isn't, isn't satisfied anymore and a bunch of records go null because of that. Well, that could also be an intentional change. Right? It, it could be that, that that's you know, reflecting an intentional change in, in how you think about the data. And so the real answer is, how do you get a human into that loop with as much context as possible? in order to enable them to make a decision about whether or not this is likely due to um, a data quality issue or whether or not this is due to something exogenous. Uh, so I think there's a couple of things that can help with that. You know, one is you want to make sure you're only alerting them to things that are you know, material um, and to important data. Second, you want to provide visualizations, you want to provide context, record level analyses, Right, that, that quickly summarize exactly where the issue is happening. It's kind of it really painful for an end user to get an alert that says, you know, this, this table has a bunch of null values in it. And that's all, right? Now it's all on them to go in and start to query for those and try to understand them and figure out, well, why is this different than yesterday? If instead you can get a whole bunch of visualizations and summary statistics that make it very clear, this is the exact segment where these appeared. This is the time of day where they started arriving. You know, this is the distribution of that over time and how this is clearly you know, very, very different. That provides a lot of help. And then the other one is timeliness, right? If you get the notification immediately, it's so much easier to ask you know, the team that's responsible for the geography where this, you know, this issue is happening, what's, what's going on? Is there anything that could be causing this? And, and to get to an answer and then to be able to either act on it because it is a data quality issue or dismiss it and move on if not. I really like this idea of providing um, a lot of really nice visualizations and statistics right off with, uh, with an alert. I've had so many conversations lately about alert fatigue. There's this huge tension between more alert alerting and, and better insight into data and alert fatigue. And so if you get an alert and you can actually immediately see something and, and make sort of a, a heuristic assessment based on visualization without having to dig in that the amount of effort required goes way, way down. That's, that's, that's right. Fantastic. And that's a big part to preventing alert fatigue is reducing the cognitive effort and investment of the end user. Um, uh, and the other way you can do that is by correctly routing things and making it easy to kind of triage and, and forward issues, right? If you've got one alert channel with data issues flooding into it, and 100 people in that channel from five different teams or 10 different teams, just the cognitive load of going, is this relevant to me or not, is also going to be really high. So reducing the kind of cognitive load on the end users is really important. That's interesting. It probably helps prevent, uh, what was it, the bystander effect as well? Oh, where no one wants to step up because everyone else, there's a huge, like there are 50 people in the channel, therefore no one is responsible for yeah, it. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that before. But yeah, I mean, I think about it in the context of ownership. Right. Um, it's so important to, for any any organization to have clear ownership for for data, for components of data and that drives accountability um, associated with issues in that data. And so, yeah, that right. by, bystander effect, I think, is very, very real if you've got a big audience. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, how often are you seeing it where, where teams are given, a, um, a, let's say, a lot of uh, responsibility without a lot of authority to, to deal with issues? I think best best practice organizations will do this, and you know, in some sense, the organizational model, um, you know, of how of how product is shipped and how data is manipulated and decisions are made, you know, should create some natural boundaries for ownership of data, and you should have the you know the at Instacart, 
if it was related to things happening in the shopper app, the product manager of the shopper app should feel a, 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 a high degree of ownership for the quality of the data that is being emitted by that shopper app and is being fed into the dashboards that they're using and is powering the machine learning algorithms. And that should carry down through the folks in the data team you know, working on problems in that domain and the data engineers supporting them. I think it's a little bit more challenging in a lot of enterprises where data ownership is, you know, it's it's kind of coming, it's coming kind of coming late into this game, right? There, where you might have you might have a lot of legacy systems that are all interacting in some complex ways. And the and the idea of well, who owns the data has often been handed to IT, you know, to the to the chief chief information officer, the folks that are running the systems. And in a world where most of the data quality issues you're encountering are because systems are down. You know, there's there's something to be said for that. And a lot of companies do start out that way. But that's really just the tip of the iceberg of data quality issues, right? You can have lots of systems all being up and then you have all of the logical human process and external changes that can affect data quality that don't manifest as any system going down. And if you've got data quality in the hands of an IT organization and they don't actually know anything about the flow of the contents of the data itself, they aren't going to be able to have ownership and they're not going to be able to triage things. They're not going to be able to fix them effectively and you won't make a lot of progress. So I think one of the, the, the greatest organizational lessons I found is you, if you're going to do data quality monitoring and remediation, you need to get subject matter experts into the system, people who actually understand the contents of the data. Well, I'm, this is all music to my ears. I, I'm optimistic that... Uh, product owners and and people on the app side are increasingly concerned with analytics and so that they are taking ownership of that. I would say that the general, the cliche, you know, 20 years ago was that was not the case, that it was just throw it over the wall, generate the data. It's data warehousing's <laughs> job to deal with this stuff. It's not my problem. And I hope we're kind of getting past that at this point. Yeah. Another, another um, kind of set of... Um, you know, analogies I like to use here yeah, to think about this problem is, you know, I, I encounter a lot of organizations where, where they, you know, the, the beginning of a call, they admit, you know, our data is, is not of high quality. We, we're in this bad state. And it's really made me wonder, well, how do you get there? How do you end up in that? Mm. Because it's, it's not actually something that happens. Um, it, you know, no, no data begins bad, or it's very rare that in the very inception of a system, the data is bad. Right. Generally, software is relatively well tested and it's behaving as expected. So I think most systems, most sets of data begin their life with high quality. What happens is over time, data quality issues get introduced into that system and they go unnoticed. Um, and those uh, you know, go unnoticed oftentimes indefinitely or for years. And you end up with a series of things that occur around each of those data quality issues. I like to call the data quality issues themselves once they've once they've stuck in the data as scars, right? And so if you come back to the data later, there are all of these data quality scars sitting in the data. Many of them are unknown. Many of them are still lasting today. Um, and so it's the accumulation of a bunch of those scars that leads you to a position where you have bad data quality. And then there are what I call shocks. And so every time a data quality issue happens, it introduces a shock into the data. And actually, every time one of them is fixed, it usually introduces a shock in the fix as well. And those shocks are what really affect machine learning models and data-driven products, because there's a sudden distribution change in the data. Um, and so you, know, you try to go in and backfill. Backfilling can kind of paper over the scar, but there's often going to be scar tissue there. Um, and so, you know, the, the way to end up in a, to, to get to a place where your data quality is high is to have some process and system for identifying these issues and fixing them before they accumulate over time. And, you know, fighting the kind of slow erosion of data quality that I think is just inherent and natural in any complex system. Well, and especially if we, if we are trying to take an agile approach in our apps, that is going to lead to constant changes in the data. It's just a reality in that there is this tension with machine learning models where you're trying to do a lot of nice longitudinal analysis, and yet the data changes so much over time, even if the quality is high, right. that it becomes hard to compare a data point from, say, 2021 20, with a data point from 2022. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's very true and, and I think somewhat inherent. I mean, I think about trying to work in a complex code base and trying to make decisions about one part of the code base and how it's going to affect 
you know, the functioning of a very well-tested code base, right, across the entirety. And I think that's very difficult to do well, but we have good software engineering best practices and tools to try to mitigate it. I think then trying to think about, well, what's the stream of data that's going to be emitted and the consequences on that stream of data from an entire application as I'm making a change in the code is almost impossible. Um, and, and I think much, much, much harder to think about because that is gonna be an intersection of everything happening in the application and the real world, right? Flowing through this thing in, in a very stateful and complex way. That's really interesting. Kind of going back to your comment too about you know a lot of data quality issues, they, they don't tend to manifest themselves immediately, but it seems to be more of a, uh, it's a process to get there. I guess it's, it's sort of like uh, gaining weight or something over time. It doesn't, uh, probably not gonna gain 50 pounds in a day, but um, over, over years, it's totally possible. I mean, mm -hmm. So how do you, you know, how do you go back and address what those root causes might have been? Is or is that analysis even worth it? At that yeah, point? actually, no. I think it is really important, and this is another. It intersects with the the kind of data quality tools and monitoring approaches, because I I think that you know as you think about well, how do you monitor data quality? I, I like to think in three different buckets. You can set up rules, right? Hard and fast constraints about the data. You can monitor statistics for you know, unexpected changes, distribution, percentage nulls, et cetera. Or you can try to, you know, understand the, the, the distribution and contents of the data itself, use machine learning to try to detect are there significant distributional shifts. And they all have different strengths and advantages. I really like the rules-based approach for addressing historic data quality issues. And I think it's a combination of visualizations and profiling and putting that in front of a subject matter expert. They can look at visualizations and identify, oh, this just doesn't Intuitive makes sense to me, given the data, uh, given the, the business and the, and the physics of the business, um, but then giving them a system to be able to express that as a constraint or a rule on the data, test it historically, and then learn to see exactly where it's being violated. And I've seen this with, I don't know, 30 or 40 different data teams across many different verticals, where they will look at a table that is very important to them, and they'll visually, from profiling, immediately see something that's suspicious. And they think, I don't, I don't see how this column could be null. This doesn't make sense. Or the distribution of unique values here is just, just doesn't make sense. And they'll write the rule, they'll assert it, and they'll recognize from the visualizations, oh, this is happening when the event type is X. And I, yeah, I remember now, when the event type is X, it's actually impossible to have this field. And so it makes sense for it to be null. So I'm going to you know, change this rule, and I'm going to say, OK, well, it should never be null when event type is not X. They run it again and, oh, it's still null. Now it's only null 0.1% of the time. And that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And it looks like it's only happening in you know, this specific situation. Ah, there is the real data quality issue. Um, and so that is a, a very human, iterative, visual, and assertion process that can help you identify and clean up historical issues. Um, all of the algorithms, the machine learning for time series detection or for general anomaly detection in data, they're really just about finding structural changes in the data. And you can kind of back test and go back in time and ask the question, well, where were the structural changes and try to analyze each of those. But what I found is generally there's not enough context in the organization left to go through and figure out which of those were data quality issues and what the source was and, and then try to remediate them. Um, and so it's far more important to use those algorithms on a go forward basis to catch potential issues that are alive and be able to address them to try to, then to try to dig through the history of the data. That's interesting. So, so I think part of the perspective here is that it's really important to treat data quality as a real-time issue because realistically, it just takes so much energy to try to go back and fix stuff in the past, basically. Yeah, yeah you've, got to, yeah, you've got to prevent the erosion, the further erosion of the quality of the data. Um, and then you can kind of get ahead by having humans in the loop to fix issues in the, in the past. And this is a very good point, too, because uh, often once the data is broken, you actually can't fix it historically. So in other words, that null is missing data that somewhere got mangled and it, it's unrecoverable. And so if you're monitoring real time, you can only minimize try to fix it. You're, you're yeah. likely to introduce leakage into your machine learning model. Yes, totally. Uh, exactly. I remember like people, you know, uh, I, I used to work in uh, AutoML and, and whatnot, and people would suggest, oh, let's go back and fix the data, the, all the nulls, let's do some imputation methods or something. And I'm like, I don't know that that's a good idea. It's, you might just be introducing a, 
you know, one knoll for a, a different problem that yeah. now you have to Yeah, the leakage problem is very, very real. You know, if you're if oh, you're yeah. super disciplined and you've got created at edit you know, last edited at updated at timestamps everywhere and you trust them, you know, then maybe you can avoid using something from the future to fix that null value. Um, but it's pretty tough to do. Um, and yeah, if you if you go in and impute it, you know, most often you're just gonna be the 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 next machine learning model will be able to tell that value was imputed. Um, and you know, if anything, it's just going to lead to weird confidence estimates for you know variable variant variable importance estimates. Um, it's just going to be confusing in the end. Um, and so, I, I like to think about in a machine learning context, if you've got a data quality issue, if you've got some scar, you know, one of the important things is to include you know the the actual time you know that the data was measured from. Think about it, just encoded as a as a as a as an epic right offset from 1970 include that in your machine learning model so that it can learn that for a period of time, this variable meant something other than what I would expect. Um, and now it's changed. I, I really like this perspective too, because I haven't heard this perspective very much. Uh, generally, we hear about data quality treated as like just a, just a data engineer's issue, just a, an analyst issue, go fix the data quality. But this idea that your models need to be tuned to deal with data quality is, is very refreshing as well. Yeah, I, I'm a I'm a big believer in retraining models as often as you possibly can. You know, my my default assumption is machine learning models should be retrained, you know, every week, and in part that gives you um, more resilience to being able to to allow the model to be able to adjust and account for data quality issues, the the shocks on on either end of those scars, right? Because uh, I have seen. I've seen as many examples of a data quality issue being fixed causing machine learning model to go awry <laughs> as I have being introduced to causing a machine learning model to go awry. And so retraining right. model constantly is super important. Um, and then if you can add any kind of um, uncertainty estimates on the model outputs, I think that's also incredibly powerful. Interesting. I actually got a comment here. Somebody says, uh... David Smith here says he, he would disagree with the historical data. Sometimes he says the only solution is the uh, disaggregation of the data and remodeling. And any thoughts on this uh, pushback? Yeah, I, I think that that can be true if you have what I would call a, a, a regime shift, right, where you have a complete break in the in the physics and structure of what happened, you know, from one period of time to another. Um, but if you've got a sufficiently flexible model, it ought to be able to you know, learn that regime shift, right? So it does depend upon the flexibility of your model. If you're building a, a generalized linear model, um, you've got to be much more careful about this because it's not going to be able to learn interactions. And you know, if you're combining you know, data from, from phase A and phase B, and those are fundamentally different data sets, you're going to end up with some bad interpolation of the two, right? Um, but if the model is sufficiently flexible, it should be able to learn about that shift and account for it. And in general, almost always, there are uh, things that are uh, being measured, observed in the first phase that will still be relevant in, in the second phase. It's a subset of things that have changed. Let me ask this question. Are there particular uh, machine learning techniques that work better for these situations where you have, let's let's call it changing data quality as opposed to bad data quality, maybe where the data model is changing over time. Or, or even a, 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 a statistical and machine learning techniques. Yeah, yeah, that's just, a good point, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I think what I just what I just said is one, right? Anytime you're using a, um, a model that doesn't account for time and interactions with time, you're at risk right. of badly interpolating you know, over you know, data quality scars and shocks um, and being badly disrupted by them. Um, you know, I, 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 anytime I build any kind of model on, on structured data, uh, gradient boosted decision trees is where I start, you know, often something like XGBoost. Um, and, you know, it's able to learn these kinds of shifts and adapt to them pretty quickly. Um, and so that's definitely a great place to start. Um, so, you know, that's probably the, the you know, the, the best thing. I, I love Shap, Shapley values. Um, mm. I know that they have their limitations, but I think they're still incredibly powerful. It's performant. Um, and you can use them to visualize even interactions of features. And so understanding the role that any given feature in your XGBoost model is having um, and its importance at, with interacted with the time component can help you spot sensitivity to these kinds of, of shocks and changes. 
Interesting. How do you, with XG Boost Center, are you, are you uh, um, doing some sort of a classification problem with it? Um, well, you can do classification, or... you can do regression with XG Boost. Too. Yeah. Uh, you I, can I do multi class how... classification as well. If you're, if you're labeling data, like how, how do you, are there some good practices in terms of labeling data uh, for anomaly detection? Oh, well, so if we're trying to, if we're trying to actually detect anomalies with machine learning, um, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think this is really interesting, and it goes back to the three different approaches that I said, right? You've got rules, which we've covered. You've got the time series piece, right? And the strategy there is, is you know, take every every column and every table that you care about and compute a bunch of different metrics, and for each of those metrics, observe it over time and do anomaly detection in time series. And the way I like to frame and think about that is, okay, given the series history up until today. Um, what is the uh, distribution that I would expect values to arrive today? Right? What is that? What can I predict the distribution for today? And then where in that distribution did today's value actually arrive? Um, did it arrive way outside of that distribution, above or below? Um, and you can do even things like quantile regression in time series as a as a as a means of estimating the the specific quantile for the value that arrived today. And so that's a useful kind of structural framing for anomaly detection with time series. Now, the challenge with that is if you compute all the time series for all of the metrics, for all of the columns and all of the tables, you are going to drown, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. uh, you know, any single change in your data is going to cause, you know, 5,000 alerts. And so it's not helpful. And they also don't do a good job of telling you, well, where in the data did the issue happen, right? You just know right. that something changed. You don't know where, like what segment did it change in? And so the, the more novel approach that we developed at Anomalo is to use, we use graded boosted decision trees to look at samples of data from tables. And so we will take a random sample of records from a table every single day. And you can actually frame it as a supervised machine learning problem in a simplistic case. Let's say I've got a sample of data from today and a sample of data from yesterday. If I label all of today's uh, records with the, with the label one, and all of yesterday's records with the label zero, and build a graded boosted decision tree to try to predict, you know, all of these together, which ones are ones and which ones are zeros. Mm. Okay, well, you've got a couple of, of of things that can happen. One is, you know, the model learns nothing; it can't tell, you know, which ones are ones and which ones are zeros. Well, if that's the case, then there must not be anything that is materially different between the distributions of these two sets of data, or at least I failed to encode it correctly for the graded boosted decision tree, which is a separate problem. And so then if that's if that's the case, I can, you know, I can I can assume that, well, you know, these are very, 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 very similar. There has been no structural change. If instead the model is able to kind of perfectly separate the data, then there must be some features, and you can use things like Shapley values to identify, you know, where in the data it's able to make this separation that allow me to detect, you know, which records are coming from today versus yesterday. Now the, the thing that will happen is that of course you'll have the date column. <laughs> Uh, all of the date columns will be going up. And so those will all be trivially used to separate the data. So you have to remove all of those. You'll have auto incrementing IDs. Those will trivially separate the data. Yeah. You'll have data sets where users are going in and doing deploys and that's causing new version numbers or they're launching advertising campaigns that's you know causing new campaign IDs. And that creates a background chaos. You've got day of week seasonality and other kinds of patterns like that. So there's a lot of work from that simple idea to turn it into something that works in a general purpose. But but it but it can. That's what that's what we do. We we use that to ultimately be able to identify not just is there a structural change in the data, but what are the specific sets of values that contributed to that structural change? And then you can characterize those sets of values and visualize them and help explain it. So this this kind of brings you back to the Pope visits your city problem, presumably. You, you start doing this analysis and you drill down and you strip out all this other data that's just from like internal, like from dates, from incrementation, from deploys. And then you see, oh, we're seeing this weird like traffic signal between yesterday and today. And that's how our model could differentiate between the two. And so there's our anomaly, basically. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, a part of the kind of Pope visits the city problem is, is that there is, in practice, there's actually lots of those kinds of disruptions, right? Every city has their, um, you know, has their specific uh, parades and local events. There will be big sporting games that travel and move through different cities. And so one of the things that we do in this algorithm is we measure how chaotic you know, every feature of every table is. 
and we actually uh, uh, um, we we store all of that um, you know metadata in the client's environment, and then build time series models on those, and dampen any of the features that are very highly chaotic, um, so that they end up not not contributing as much to the to the anomaly scores. So, so how did this affect your modeling approaches at Institute Card? If you could say, w once you started seeing these specific anomalies, did you start collecting other data, like collecting data about sporting events and then trying to integrate that into your models in various ways? Yeah, so well, one thing to be clear is we didn't do this at Instacart. This is all anomalous for the last four years. At Instacart, okay. we were doing the rules-based approach. Anybody could write a SQL query that would return bad data and get an email notification. Um, and we did the you know time series anomaly detection, right? Cap capture all the time series and do anomaly detections on them. Um, so really, this this machine learning fully automated approach is something that we built for Anomalo. Um, so we've seen it, but we've seen it play out at a bunch of different companies um, over the last four years. And you know this idea of um, you know I want to bring additional third party data and use it to kind of compare against what's happening in the table and adjust for it is something that comes up pretty frequently. And in practice, I think there's, it's not a very realistic thing to do. Um, and, and it's actually not super necessary. It's not very realistic because you probably have a few hundred tables that you want to run this on, maybe thousands of tables. And so trying to go through and think about, well, what's all of the context that I would want to bring to bear and how would I ensure that it's being used effectively isn't really worth the investment. The second piece is that um, oftentimes that context gets brought into the model as additional columns in the table. And so, you know, this is this is often, you know, the, the the highest value is applying this to the fact tables in the organization, right? Those those you know twenty or thirty tables that have integrated everything from across um, you know, the domain for all orders, right, or all transactions of type X. And then a lot of that context is often already there. And then the third piece is this, you know, uh, adjusting for the chaos of the data and dampening means that you just can ignore a lot of those factors. Kind of switching gears a bit, um, we, we chatted a couple of weeks ago. We, we were uh, kind of going off on the uh, large, large language models and uh, data quality. Yeah. I think you, you were, it was a topic that really excited you um, at, when we chatted. Um, you want to walk us through like, what, what, what's on your mind when it comes to large language models and data quality? Yeah, well, so it, there's maybe to, to get a step back, like, why do, I, why, do I, why do I think about this? Well, in this context of building you know, uh, uh, models to do anomaly detection, it's got to work on arbitrary data, right? Uh, arbitrary structured data from arbit arbitrary different you know, verticals. And so it's going to be deployed and it's going to run on, you know, a hundred different tables capturing wildly different data in, you know, a thousand different environments, you know, each each one with, you know, many hundreds or thousands of tables. And the the challenge of thinking, well, how do you build systems that generalize in those contexts is really difficult. How do you automatically do feature encoding? How do you control for all of the edge cases that you encounter? And so I've, um, you know, I've thought about this in that context. I've thought about it back at Instacart. One of the most interesting challenges was predict when each user will come back and order again, um, and actually build a build a, a survival model, right, to predict the distribution to the likely next order for every individual user. And think about that in the context of all of the transactional and you know, structured data and the sequences of all of that data prior to the most recent touch point that you had with each user. And if you build that model in that context, you actually build this very valuable asset, especially if there's like a embedding layer right before you make the prediction. That embedding layer is this inherent representation of that customer, their relationship with the entity, and you can use that for so many different purposes, right? Everything on recommendations to advertising to lots of different lots of different activities. And so I've been wondering, you know, what is the future of you know learning on on structured data? Um, and large language models have just completely revolutionized how you think about machine learning in the context of text. And you know, one of the inherent ideas. Uh, really, you know, two that I would say that are that are really meaningful. One is the the notion of embedding, right? Can you create a embedding representation for uh, snippets of language that's general purpose? Um, you know, the other one is is sequence based modeling, 
you know, it's now transformers, but same same idea, being able to predict the, you know, the next utterance in a sentence, right? Or then, you know, and then iterating and sampling from that. And so I think about that in the context of structured data. And you know how today XGBoost dominates in almost all structured uh, uh, problems, and but part of that is because of the context the model is given. You know when you think about XGBoost being applied to a structured data set, all it has is that one data set, the 10,000, 100,000, 1 million rows. It has no external context. It has to start from first principles on that data set. How do you break that? And so I think there are some really interesting ideas here. And uh, one of them is, could you create a general purpose embedding for a row of arbitrary structured data? And one way to think about that is, well, what if you had metadata about each call, right? And that metadata would be what would be typically stored in a company's data catalog. Uh, what's the definition? How was it collected? And what are its typical use cases? And what if you took each row of data and you associated that metadata with the column with each value and put that into a paragraph and fed it into a large language model, right? Think about it as like, you know, a document representation where each value, you know, the uh, day since X is put in the context of what the business knows that value means and collected together into a document and fed into something like a large language model to get an embedding of that, of that, of that document's representation of the row. And then think about the idea of sequence modeling in that context. You know, in almost all log data sets, you've got some entity, you know, it could be a physical device, it could be a person, it could be a company that's doing repeated transactions in that log. Build a model that's really good at taking these kinds of um, embeddings and making predictions about what the next, you know, embedding is going to look like uh, for each entity. Right, and essentially train it to be able to, uh, you know, synthetically generate new <coughs> transactional records in arbitrary sets of transactional data. If you could do this and run it on all of the data stored in all of the Snowflake deployments, you know, maybe in a federated environment, right? So that you know, in a, in a differentially private environment, you've got lots of challenges there: scalability challenges, privacy challenges, um, contractual challenges. But if you could do that, um, then I think you begin to get um, to this, you know, very uh, powerful representation of any structured row of data that could then be fed into a graded boosted decision tree to predict, you know, whether or not each transaction is going to be fraudulent or not, because you've got a small number of fraudulent act activities. But that gradient boosted decision tree is going to be so much more powerful, I believe, than the ones that we build only on that individual, you know, set of data. Yeah, it's definitely the coolest idea I've heard. And sounds in really while. cool. So, yeah, when, when are you trying this? That's the question. No, it's it's <laughs> it's really interesting. Yeah, you know, I'm not I'm not sure it's possible yet. Um, yeah. you know, there are some. I've seen some. There's a there's there's one package. I don't remember it now. That is trying this concept of taking metadata and the values from records, and you know, integrating them together and creating representations of the data. So I think that's already being tried now. It, it kind of makes makes sense. And there's a lot of approaches out there for sequence modeling on structured data. You know, I did some at Instacart. I know there are a lot of other social media platforms. Think about this, like what's the next piece of content consumed in a social media platform by each user? Right. If you can predict that really well, you actually have created a great representation of the user. And so I think what's missing is how could you combine those two and train it on not just one you know, data set with 10 billion rows, but a billion data sets you know, each with a million rows or, or a billion rows. Um, and I, I think the, those exist. I don't think we have the computational resources to do it yet. And I'm not sure that we have the kind of legal contractual privacy uh, constraints to do it yet. Um, but it won't, I, I think we'll get there before too long. It won't be long. And instead of seeing models that are trained on predicting the next word um, in the sentence um, or generating images, it'll be predicting the next frame or the next you know, minute of frames in a video. Um, and I think that that is, uh, from a data computational perspective, is as equally or, or possibly more challenging than what I'm proposing. Yeah, it's interesting too. Like, um, <clears throat> like who was it? Like Bill Inman, for example, right? He's been spending the last 20 years working on a you know textual ETL, as he calls it, right? So recognizing that a lot of the data in a business is actually text data; it's not in rows and columns. And this is you know been his obsession. I think. 
when you talk to him, he's forgotten about the data warehouse world he invented way back in the day. It's all about text. And, and so it's, but I think his goal too is to kind of fuse, you know, together these, the two worlds of like the structured data, all the text that you, you, you find, um, you know, laying yeah. around the business. So I think, yeah, the idea is interesting because it could, because the amount of unstructured data that a business relies upon is, um, well, it's growing every day, you know, yeah. and depending on how you use it, obviously, and the metadata that it's attached to it. So, yeah, this is it really is. fascinating. It gets us back to this notion of, I think we've talked about this a little bit before, but you know, structured data is this you know, tip of the iceberg, and it's this convenience factor of, you know, it's it's more efficient to store, more efficient to operate, more efficient to, to visualize. We have mental models for working with data that's stored in a structural way. So we take you know, real world phenomena or complex digital phenomena, and we turn them into structured representations as annotations or summary statistics about what actually happened. And I think that there is an element of that that's really inherently powerful as a focus, right? This is the thing that matters, right? What matters is the number of milliseconds that this transaction took. All of the things that occurred in that transaction itself are less important to me than that total duration. But um, you can, you know, you can, uh, there are, there are other, you know, besides just text, I think there's a lot of other data that we are not working with or collecting, oh, yeah. right? And so if I think about, I'm an e-commerce um, a company and I, today I'm capturing log records that are a bunch of, you know, semi-structured data associated with what the user yeah. was actually doing. I could instead have the video representation of the pixels on their screen as they were interacting with my website or application. Um, and that could be you know, the data representation of what they did. And I could ask a model to predict what are they going to do next, right? What would that, what would that look like? What would that look like in a, in a constrained environment? Um, uh, there is a, a great app called Rewind put, put out by a friend, friend of mine, Dan Soroker, um, that allows you to capture everything happening on your own computer locally and replay that. Um, and so I think that's a, a fascinating store of uh, everything that you as an individual are doing on your device. Um, that's you know, far, far richer than even just the text that we're appearing on the screens um, or the you know, structured or semi-structured log data coming out of all the applications you're using. Interesting. I'm just kind of joking. I'm, I'm staring off in the distance and the NSA's uh, data center is like right over the about 20 miles that way. <laughs> I'm sure they're so, listening to all of I'm sure they ideas. got the data set yeah, yeah, already. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, nicely. yeah. Yeah. I mean, all of these things come with, you know, uh, significant privacy implications and you see what's happening today, even with the, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the models for generative, uh, generative art and, you know, people, uh, people getting very upset that their style can be so easily represented and, and somehow must be embedded and in, integrated into those models. Um, you know, because it was trained on data that's in the public domain. Um, and so even just using data in the public domain comes with a tremendous amount of risk and uncertainty. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of these challenges as we as we think even deeper about, you know, other other ways of using this data. Well, I, I don't agree with these assertions that these models are conscious yet. I mean, you can debate about specific aspects of consciousness. They're real. <laughs> <laughs> but but we do have to start thinking about the difference between a human learning from all this data, because that's what you do through your entire career and through college, right? You're learning on all this publicly available data versus doing the same thing with a deep learning model that can now do this at a much vaster scale. It's basically doing something very human, but at a massive scale that we can't, yeah. humans can't replicate at this point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, ultimately yeah. what, we're, what we're doing is we're training algorithms to be able to predict what would the average human do in this situation? Um, or, you know, given this context, what would the average, you know, uh, uh, next set of, of of text uttered in the public corpus likely be or allow us to sample from the distribution of what that would be. I think that is a very far way away from consciousness. Um, at the same time, I'm not entirely sure that we're conscious or that we know what consciousness means in a scientific exactly. context. And so I think it's, you know, it's kind of silly to ask, um, yeah. you know, is an algorithm conscious if we can't, if we can't clearly articulate why we are. Yeah, and I think what you're proposing too for business data. I mean, the thing that came to my mind was um, TikTok, in terms of how it's just uh, it, it, it's got an uncanny um, algorithm, right? It, it can recommend new stuff, and I think with enough data, um, enough quality data, you know, bring it back, and, and enough, uh, you know, um, I guess you need to figure out like what what is it you're trying to drive at. But I get to see like kind of an algorithm algorithm first uh, world in business, even you know. This, let take hold, but yeah. 
who knows well to loop back about what you were data doing. sucked for a really long time so you got to solve that problem too so oh, yeah yeah that's like always a problem right? Around, yeah, so. yeah. right but i mean right. going back to the structured data discussion yeah the structured data is like this walled garden of data it's just bit like very clean and nice but it really does limit your representation of the world in fact you're you're reading this book isn't it something like data and reality joe yeah, no, it's, yeah. It's, and that's very yeah. much the problem that you face with structured data, right? Like, does it really represent reality or not? And so these new models do open up the possibility of having much unstructured data that really represents what's going on in the real world. And we can actually analyze it now instead of just letting it sit. The quality is an interesting thing, though, too. I mean, if you read through the uh, GPT-3 paper that was a couple of years ago, I mean, one of the big problems they had to face was uh, it, because there were so many, there's so much data, the uh, test and train set uh, cross-contaminated. Oh yeah. So yes. Um, so yeah, that's very, that very, happen. very, very easy to have that happen. And I've seen that happen many, many times as a as a fundamental data quality issue in structured data. Right, duplicated data is the biggest thing that caused. That's that's why I my if I had to pick, and I, I I get to I get to look at them all. But if I had to pick one data quality issue that I could never suffer from again, it would be duplicated data. And it's uh, because of that leakage problem, um, it's so easy for duplicated data to end up being randomly sampled into both train and test um, and really, really ruining the, the effectiveness of the models. Um, I think structured data is going to be here forever. Um, and in, in yeah. the, But it's going to increasingly, the balance of its value is going to shift towards the measurement and evaluation of outcomes, labels, right, um, rather than features. That's really Cool. Well, awesome. That's uh, a lot of profound uh, chats. In yeah, last this, 10 was, this was great. This was really cool. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's um, been really fun. Yeah, for sure. Love to have you back on sometime again. Um, well, once you've solved this problem, you can come back and explain it to us. <laughs> or a robot can do it for it. <laughs> yeah. So just how yeah. would Jeremy Stanley uh, answer this question? Um, yeah. So yeah, it's awesome. For, for people who want to learn more about you and Anomalo, how can they do that? Yeah, so you can follow me on Twitter at Jeremy Stan, and Anomalo is uh, just anomalo.com. Um, cool. You can go there and learn all about us. Um, so either of those are probably the best best places to find me or Anomalo. Awesome. And do you have any uh, upcoming events, uh, speaking engagements that you want to give a shout out to? Well, that's a or good question. Uh, yes, uh, I do. I can't remember them off the top of my head. Uh, <laughs> it's just kind of I just go uh, where my team tells me to go. Um, okay. Uh, that's kind of how my life works right now. <laughs> so I think we're getting we're getting we're gonna have some bigger events later this year, but the you know they haven't they haven't uh, uh, you know announced publicly yet. So I've got to wait on some of the big ones. But you can find out about them. Antarctica, uh, Jeremy. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Um, speaking of events, so Matt and I are gonna be in Austin, Texas. Um, what Saturday? The Saturday? Yeah. Yeah. The for Saturday, uh, day to day yep. Texas. Um, oh, nice. It's probably the most packed speaker lineup I've seen in a long time. We got, um, obviously, Matt and I, so that's reason enough to come out. i um, joking. Um, there's a Jamak. Uh, she's uh, keynoting uh, the opening. We're actually closing the keynote. And then uh, so Chad Sanderson, um, uh, yeah, Bill Inman, I don't know, a lot of people, Eddie, Eddie Pollack. Yeah, I mean, it's more like who's not showing up to this. So. Well, are, are those talks being streamed or is it just in person? I, I, don't, I don't know. Okay. You, yeah. You, anyway, if you're in Austin over that weekend, definitely look us up. And, Sounds yeah. like a good excuse to go to Austin if you're not. Yeah. 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 Exactly. You should, you should come <laughs> yeah, up. It'd be really good. So it'd be awesome. Um, yeah. Then a Monday, next Monday morning data chat with uh, John Coutet from uh, Stream. So we're going to talk about real time stuffs. So it'll be a lot of fun. So. Anyway, Jeremy, um, you know, you got to uh, hop to a call. So essentially sensitive of your time. But yeah, thanks. Uh, illuminating chat. Love talking to you. So um, and thanks to the audience. We'll, we'll, we'll chat soon. So yeah, thank you, Joe and Matt. This was wonderful. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Take Bye. care. Peace.